There is a well-known story involving the famous mystic, St. Padre Pio, and a lukewarm Christian. As the story is told, after the individual informs the saint that she does not believe in hell, he replied, You will believe in it soon enough when you get there. His words echo the sentiments of St. Faustina Kowalska, who wrote in paragraph 741 of her diary, When an angel led her to hell, she noticed most of the souls were those who did not believe there was a hell. And polling by the Pew Research Center shows that this woman encountered by Padre Pio and those seen by Sister Kowalska are not alone in their rejection of hell. While 85% of Catholics believe in heaven, only 63% believe in hell. In Catholic eschatology, which is the study of the last things, the four last things are generally summarized as death, judgment, heaven, and hell. But for about a quarter of all Catholics, the four last things have been reduced to the three last things of death, judgment, and heaven, or perhaps simply the two last things of death and heaven, with no judgment and no hell. So, what happened to hell? In this episode of Catholic History Trek, I will trek through hell, or at least its history. God bless America. God love you. I want these to be my first words of greeting to you. They will be the concluding words on each broadcast. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Annuncio office. God remind you. Abemus Papam. You've embarked on a Catholic history trek. Before beginning our trek through hell, I suppose I should define my terms. In the Apostles' Creed, we find the line that Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. This line often causes confusion because it sounds like Jesus went to the fiery abode of the damned. But the hell from the creed is not that hell. The hell of the Apostles' Creed is what is known as Abraham's bosom, or the limbo of the fathers. It is the place where the righteous went after death before Jesus opened the way to heaven by his death. Sort of a waiting room for the holy souls. It's the same place mentioned in the Gospel of Luke in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, waiting to go to heaven, while the rich man, traditionally named Dives, is tormented in the actual hell. The Pew Research polling I previously mentioned showed a majority of Christians believe in the existence of hell, the actual hell, but among Jews, that number is only 22%. This is likely because among the Jews there has not been a consistent teaching on hell, or even heaven. Even in Jesus' time, views on the afterlife separated the Pharisees and Sadducees. While the Pharisees believed in an afterlife and the resurrection, the Sadducees rejected both. Which is why, as they say, They were sad, you see. Interestingly, even though many of the Jews did not believe in hell, the Old Testament mentions it many times. It is referred to as Sheol, which was a subterranean underworld for the dead, where both the wicked and the righteous were destined. It was the equivalent of Hades, which was the realm of the dead for the Hellenized world which surrounded the Jews, although the Greeks further divided Hades into Tartarus, where the truly wicked would be eternally punished, and the Elysian Fields, where the truly virtuous resided. And even though Judaism did not have a definitive teaching on hell, that did not stop Jesus from speaking of it, and speaking of it frequently. Jesus refers to hell as an abyss, the exterior darkness, a place of torments, a furnace of fire, an unquenchable fire, and an everlasting fire. Our Lord made it very clear that hell exists, and it is not a pleasant place. To paint an image of its reality, to his Jewish listeners, Jesus frequently likened it with the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, also called Gehenna. This was a location of utmost contempt to the Jews because King Ahaz had used it for the worship of Moloch and had made profane offerings to the false gods there. Among these sacrifices to the demons, King Ahaz had burned his own sons. The disciples of Jesus accepted his teachings on the reality of hell and its confines as the destination for the reprobate. This can be abundantly found in the writings of the New Testament. In the epistles of Saints Peter and Paul, 
Hell is described as a lower hell, perdition, eternal destruction, corruption, death, and darkness, while St. John refers to New Revelation as a second death and a burning pool of fire where the wicked are tormented forever. The early church, like the apostles, were unanimous in teaching that the wicked would be punished in hell after death, and for all eternity. St. Ignatius of Antioch, in his Epistle to the Ephesians, and St. Irenaeus, in his work against heresies, both described it as an everlasting fire. St. Justin mentioned this eternal fire half a dozen times in his second apology. In the martyrdom of Polycarp, hell is also described as an eternal fire which shall never be quenched. During his trial, Polycarp points out the folly of the proconsul threatening him with a temporary fire while being ignorant of the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Throughout history, various councils and creeds have affirmed the reality of hell. Just looking at a couple, the Athanasian Creed declares, They that have done evil shall go into everlasting fire. And the Council of Florence teaches, The souls of those who depart this life in sin go down straight away to hell to be punished. The Church has historically and consistently taught in the reality of hell, but what is hell? To answer that, I'll briefly look at the naming, the location, and pains of hell. The naming of hell in English can be traced back to the words heli or hella from Old English, German, Norse, and Dutch, which literally mean to cover or hide. The words were used to describe a hole or dark hidden place and became the name of the underworld, which was a dark hidden place under the ground. Speaking of which, where is hell? All sorts of conjectures have been made, everything from the sun, the moon, Mars, or beyond the known universe. Although the most common assertion is that hell is within the earth, as described in the Bible. Just highlighting a few examples, Ezekiel 26 describes it as the lowest parts of the earth. Number 16 tells how the earth opened under their feet and they went down into hell. And Paul's letter to the Philippians teaches that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. But do the many biblical descriptions of hell being under the earth mean that it is physically located under the earth? Maybe. Some contend these descriptions were merely metaphors to illustrate their complete separation from God. Since God is said to dwell in heaven, then those who spend eternity separated from God would be in the place farthest away from the light of heaven, which would be a dark abyss under the earth. While many theologians over the centuries have contended that hell is physically and not just metaphorically, located under the earth, the church has never made any official declarations on the matter, leaving it open to speculation. But as St. John Chrysostom reminds us, the important thing is not to ask where hell is, but how to escape it. And the reason to escape it is the pains of hell. Theologians traditionally associate two pains with hell, the pain of loss and the pain of sense. The more dreadful is the pain of loss which is the loss of the beatific vision and the total separation from God for all eternity, while the pain of sense is the torment caused by the fires of hell. These pains differ in degree, where the more wicked suffer more intensely, although every soul in hell suffers completely, with no breaks or respite from the eternity of suffering. There's a quote famously attributed to St. Teresa of Avila, in which the Carmelite mystic complained to God, If this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. One reason she may have raised a complaint was the gift she received of visiting the confines of hell. Her account of that visit included, I saw myself confined. I felt a fire in my soul. My bodily sufferings were unendurable. The most painful sufferings in this life were as nothing in comparison with what I felt, especially when I saw that there would be no intermission nor any end to them. It was a vision that so terrified her that nearly six years later, when she wrote the account, the terror was upon her again. Born during the lifetime of Martin Luther and the rise of Lutheranism, she also explained, It was that vision that filled me with a very great distress which I feel at the sight of so many lost souls, especially of the Lutherans, for they were once members of the church by baptism and also gave me the most vehement desires for the salvation of souls. For certainly I believe that, to save even one from those overwhelming torments, 
I would most willingly endure many deaths. She would also describe the great numbers of those falling into hell, that they were abundant like snowflakes falling in the winter. Another Catholic mystic who had a vision of hell was Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, who heard deep groans and cries of despair and dreadful yells and shrieks. She described the city of hell as nothing but dismal dungeons, dark caverns, frightful deserts, and fetid swamps, filled with every imaginable species of poisonous and disgusting reptile. St. John Bosco visited hell in dream. He recounted, As soon as I crossed its threshold, I felt an indescribable terror and dared not take another step. Everything was glowing white at temperatures of thousands of degrees, yet the fire did not incinerate, did not consume. When I got up this morning, I noticed that my hand was swollen, having pressed it against the wall, though only in a dream, felt so real that later the skin of my palm peeled off. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, the saint who brought us the Divine Mercy devotion, described hell as a large and extensive place of great torture. She described seven different tortures, including the loss of God, the truth of one's condition that would never change, and the fire that penetrates the soul without destroying it. She also related, Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. But I noticed one thing, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieve that there is a hell. When I came to, I could hardly recover from the fright. How terribly souls suffer there. Perhaps the most well-known contemporary vision of hell comes to us from the three Fatima children. During the July 13th apparition, Mary opened the earth and Sister Lucia recounted, We saw a sea of fire. Plunged into this fire were demons and souls in human form like transparent burning embers, all blackened, amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. As the joke goes, how do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. Many successful preachers have taken the same approach with making saints. They scared the hell out of them. One such sermon is that of St. Leonard of Port Maurice. The sermon is titled, The Little Number of Those Who Are Saved. The sermon highlights how the scriptures, saints, and theologians all stood united in teaching the majority of mankind go to hell, and it is imperative to do everything in our power to avoid such a fate. But avoiding sin is difficult. So what's one to do if they want to keep sinning, but don't want to go to hell? Quite simply, they get rid of hell. Various heresies have arisen over the centuries which have done this very thing, diminished the reality of hell and its consequences. They have come in different forms, including claiming hell is just metaphorical, not actual, or that if it exists, nobody actually goes there, or if they go there, the pains are temporary, or if they go there, the time served is temporary. That the pains are temporary, or wane, was condemned in the late 19th century by the Congregation of the Index and Holy Office. That the poor souls are eventually freed from hell is the heresy of universal salvation, which was promoted by Origen and denounced by St. Augustine. Even in the early church, we find these errors. In Tertullian's work, Against Marcion, he explains the error of the Marcionites, who give the appearance of worshiping God, but replace the true God with a God of their own creation. Their false God never takes offense, is never angry, has prepared no fires in hell, and never afflicts punishment. In the heresy, God is not to be feared, because there are no consequences. As Martin Luther proclaimed, sin and sin boldly. Another heresy is the ubiquist view of hell. Ubiquist means something that is spread everywhere, and in this heresy it was believed that the damned souls were at liberty to roam about the universe, carrying their punishment with them. Charles Dickens, who is more of a proponent of Christian values than actual Christian doctrine, used this view of hell for his story, A Christmas Carol, in which Jacob Marley roams about carrying his cash boxes and accounting ledgers. Way back in our second episode, Kevin spoke of taking pilgrimages to some of the places covered in our episodes. Thankfully, the topic of this episode is one location where Kevin nor myself have never visited, and hopefully we never will. And hopefully you will take a moment to rate, review, or subscribe to Catholic History Trek. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. 
Sicutrat in principio nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com. <laughs>